This is one of two um, talks on what I've chosen to characterize as unacceptable rates of diagnostic error in neuro and ENT imaging, and it'll be principally about ENT imaging. And there's two parts to this. One uh, is highlighted here as causes, and then there's a companion uh, talk about uh, solutions. I'll invite you during the talk, as I show references or links or things like that, to just slow down or stop the presentation and copy those because I'm not going to dwell on, on those uh, slides. What's the scope of the problem? Since 1949, there is a persistent, durable, and never-changing 30% uh, error rate on positive um, imaging studies. And there is a significant amount of harm associated with those errors. The harm is estimated at a level of 4 to 5 percent, which is, of course, unacceptably high, and it's probably higher than that 4 to 5 percent harm due to those errors. This has been documented over the years in these references, and again, I'll invite you, if you want to uh, reference those, to stop the tape and copy them down. So at the crux of this is our professional responsibility that every patient and, and referring provider of, of health care wants and deserves an expert. In fact, they believe they're getting an expert when a radiologist interprets their studies. I've uh, written about 13 essays on the current status of radiology education which and medical education in general, which needs to be modernized, and those appear at our website here, and I'll invite you to uh, uh, copy that down later or, again, stop the... Uh, stop the presentation and, and copy it down now. You might find those interesting about the deficiencies of our approach to modern uh, ed education and medicine, both at the, um, mainly at the, the postgraduate level. So what's an expert do? That's the real question. How do we create a, experts? As educators, we have to, um, we have to find uh, and eliminate all harmful uh, errors uh, and their root causes and eliminate them, and that's what experts do. They eliminate error. So how do we produce that kind of expertise in our educational systems? We've been doing a simulation now in critical care medicine for about eight years. It's been 10 years in development, and what we discovered is what we refer to as educational gaps in specific, in specific clinical scenarios, and I'm going to show you some examples of that because this is essentially, after this introduction, it's going to be a case-based uh, learning experience, an illustrative experience. In this simulation, um, we have uh, 65 cases. We simulate an eight-hour shift. It's an authentic test because we give all of the DICOM images, and we ask for short written responses in a manner similar to what the, um, the interaction between the interpreting uh, radiologist or other individual and the, and the uh, ER doctor or the critical care doctor would be. We also include normal cases, which uh, of course is essential if you're trying to do this. We've tested about 130 single what we call items or questions. Uh, in 1,200 residents, and, uh, and we have a scoring system that identifies uh, levels of, of um, professional comp competence relative to that peer group, and we have uh, an expert group of graders. Uh, the details of that uh, appear in these two papers, which won the Whitley Award for Best Educational Papers in Academic Radiology Journal in 2019. I'll uh, invite you to uh, copy those links and read those papers if you like. But in general, with regard to what is significance in this situation, is significant in this situation, the difficulty of the cases as determined by the scores of the individuals was highly significant with a very high reliability. There was some variance based on the individual resident with the end in this paper of 358 very little uh, difference in the scoring and results based on program, and essentially no variance based on, on the graders. So, and here's the uh, data from those papers showing 
the spread of case difficulty, pretty much homogeneity in the resident performance, and very little uh, to no uh, variance caused by the program, the specific program. We've tested about 45 programs throughout the United States for the graders. So let's do some cases and, and illustrate how these errors occur, why, and the impact they have. And in the second presentation, I'm going to show a solution to this, and that is an educational system that, if used properly, can eliminate these er errors. So a 30-year-old uh, person presented to the ER with acute onset of fever and mastoid and ear pain. The radiologist interpreting the study that you'll see um, uh, told the, uh, uh, the emergency medical uh, attending and the ENT attending that was uncomplicated mastoiditis. They prescribed oral antibiotics and discharged the patient. That's what they planned to do. What did this radiologist miss? You'll see the radiologist missed coalescent mastoiditis, early epidural abscess, and these other findings here. What did the radiologist not understand? The radiologist didn't understand all of the, all of the uh, elements necessary to make the proper observation. The expert attending came in and corrected all three domain areas of knowledge. How did that change outcome? The patient was immediately taken to surgical decompression. And what's the harm? The harm was avoidance of continued intracranial complications if the patient had been sent home on antibiotics. And so as we look at error in these several cases I'm going to show you, there's, there's two categories of error. That's observational error and interpreted error. And um, in in our simulation experience and our data that I summarized, failure to properly observe accounts for about 90 or 95 percent and at least 80 percent of the error. 80 percent observational alone and then observational error also contributes to interpretive error. So what, what's our job as educators? Why, why didn't this resident provide the right um, information and the attending had to come in and be sure that the right uh, diagnosis was made. Well, essentially, the, re the resident didn't understand anatomy and pathophysiology. And as educators, we're mandated to deliver those fundamentals, our behavioral objectives in radiology and each clinical scenario or case concept is to teach the related anatomy, pathophysiology, and put that in a clinical context. I would submit that we don't have a, um, a, um, a system that does that in a definite curriculum-based methodical manner. So here's the, the case, acute, and so that this is the patient who came into the AR and, and they gave you the rundown of what happened. And, uh, and the obvious diagnosis is a uh, epidural abscess, displacement of the sinus, occlusion of the uh, sigmoid sinus, and, uh, and, uh, and I'll show you some other findings in related cases in a minute. But here's our overall experience. We've given this case concept or this clinical scenario three times. And you can see uh, the average score out of 10 was three, and that's not good. Scores of three out of 10 are uh, scores that lead directly to patient harm. And you can see as we categorize the uh, errors, they're all in the, uh, the category of observational error. This arrow should be over here. So in all of the, these are the number of residents who made mistakes, and you can see most all the errors are in observational error in this, uh, this situation. And what are they failing to observe? They're failing to observe, uh, uh, to make a proper diagnosis, uh, dehiscence of the sigmoid plate and dehiscence of the mastoid cortical bone, as, as you can see here. That's coalescent mastoiditis. If you don't understand that, you'll miss the diagnosis. If you're not taught that, what are we trying to avoid? We're trying to avoid intracranial extension, vein of LeBay, uh, occlusion, thrombophlebitis, and brain abscesses, which, uh, if they're in the dominant hemisphere, can be, um, can be uh, quite uh, devastating. So that's the harm we're trying to avoid. So what 
Let's go back to our discussion. We're trying to train experts. Patients expect experts. And what does an expert do? Well, primarily, uh, it's do no harm, right? That's our oath as physicians, do no harm. So how do we avoid harm? We operate as experts in two domains. Experts should be able to call a study negative with a very high degree of confidence, which was the error in this case. This case was called routine mastoiditis. Well, you know, you go home on antibiotics. So it wasn't called negative, but it was almost called negative. And then the expert will recognize in a particular clinical scenario or case concept a fact pattern of findings, and the fact pattern will lead to an accurate diagnosis in that clinical context. Also, experts know what they know and they know what they don't know. So they know how to avoid trouble and get the patient into safe hands if they're not sure what's going on. So how do we produce such expertise is the question and will be the topic of the second talk. Let's look at another case. This three-year-old presented to the ER with subacute onset of fever, poor feeding, and drooling, a very, very common presentation of this particular condition. The patient has suppurative retropharyngeal adenitis. This is not a retropharyngeal abscess. That's a lymph node with pus in it. Here is the follow-up finding. The only difference between this and this is that this patient was treated with IV antibiotics for uh, 24 to 48 hours, and then 7 to 10 days at home. No surgery. Let's see what happened in this case. So here's the presentation. What, what was the uh, service told by radiology? They were told it was a retropharyngeal abscess by an inexperienced resident. So the patient was planned for IND, which still happens in some places in the world with a picture like this, unfortunately. Um, what did the knowledgeable attending say? The knowledgeable attending said, no, this is not a retropharyngeal abscess. This is medical disease. This is a suppurative retropharyngeal lymph node and recommended uh, a medical approach. And I already told you the outcome. And what was the harm here? The harm avoided was taking a three-year-old child to surgery to drain a retropharyngeal abscess, which was curable by IV antibiotics. This entity you'll see in the following data table was missed 97 to 100 percent of the time. What's the root cause of that? It's an interpretive failure. The findings are easy to see. It's calling it a retropharyngeal abscess that's the error. So here's our data, our experience in this. We've given this case uh, three times. We've given it to add that up over 500 residents. And here's the error, and the average score is dismal, absolutely dismal, uh, one. That, that's a complete failure to recognize the situation. And you can see in this case, out of the over, well, you can add that up, it's over 400 residents. It's an interpretive error. People see it, except for this case, for some reason, probably a little more subtle. They see it, but they don't know what it is properly. And you, in that case, you'd be sending a lot of little kids to surgery who don't need to go to surgery. That's not the desired expert behavior. Let's look at another case. This patient came into the ER with acute onset of a left facial nerve weakness and left ear pain and unsteady gait. This case will be an example of sort of bi-directional poor communication. Uh, between the uh, ER and radiology. Uh, on this uh, study, you can see there's an infiltrating mass in the nasopharynx. It's involving the petrous apex, and in fact, it got over to the first genu of the facial nerve. So that's where this uh, facial weakness came from. What happened in this case? Very interesting. So I gave you the uh, presentation. So what did a radiologist not was not informed by emergency medical service. They didn't say that the facial weakness was peripheral rather than central. And in fact, it was peripheral, right? And they didn't let us know that the patient is a poorly controlled diabetic. What the radiologists did, they activated the stroke alert team. Well, a peripheral facial nerve palsy is only going to be caused by a brainstem stroke. So, okay. However, 
the observations that were uh, missed was the infiltrating process involving the temporal bone and involving the first genu that explained everything. So what happened? This patient actually went to CT angiography and to catheter angiography, working up uh, uh, an ischemic event when all of this was perfectly explainable with proper expert interpretation of the study. The root causes in this failure, a uh, lack of proper clinical communication, sort of bi-directional, and understanding the clinical context in this, this uh, on the simulation, I'll show you the data. The average score uh, in this case was 1.45, uh, and you can see that people just fail to observe the uh, invasive mucormycosis in the nasopharynx uh, virtually 100% of the time. So it's a failure to observe in this case. Again, we've given the concept of invasive fungal rhinosinusitis four times. This is one of the four cases. And you can see that the performance in general is poor, except on this case. So in this case, there was much less observational error out of the residents that took it, E60 got it. But that's because there was a big old epidural abscess. So they saw that. And so this shows up what we call framing errors. The same concept, uh, people can perform in that concept if the findings are more obvious and, and they understand it. But in other clinical circumstances, such as this case and the other cases of fungal sinus disease, and I'll show you one more, uh, invasive fungal sinus disease, um, they perform uh, poorly and unacceptably in a disease that has a high morbidity and some mortality. So what does an expert do or somebody who's truly competent? So the next talk is going to be about competency-based radiology educational methodology. But uh, for now, uh, the uh, the expert goes beyond the basics and calls a study negative uh, with a high degree of confidence. What causes that not to happen? Failed search patterns, undisciplined search patterns that are in clinical context. That creates the observational error. What else caused the error? Then there was a lack of understanding the entire fact pattern and therefore uh, not probing the proper clinical context, not asking the ER doctor whether it was a peripheral or central uh, palsy. That's what experts do. They do the opposite of what the initial interpreter did in this study. So what are we going to do as educators to change this? Um, uh, and, and I like to refer to these as educational failures. We have a lot of very intelligent people that want to become radiologists. But as educators, uh, we have uh, discoverable knowledge gaps, and uh, they are related to the uh, error rates, and they are related, therefore, to the potential harm. So I take no credit for these concepts. That's me and Leo Riggler back in 1974, and Leo taught me the hardest thing to do was call a chest X-ray negative. That means that you have to have rules and checklists for calling studies negative and observational discipline. So I credit Leo with, with that. Bill Hanafy, my other uh, uh, teacher for years at UCLA, said you have to understand how the images are relevant and relate to the clinical situation, which means you have to form close relationships and understand what they need to know. And that's Bill's concept he taught me. So I'm just carrying on the legacy of these two great educators. So what do you got to do? You have to know the normal anatomy and normal variants. You have to have rules and a structure by which you call a study negative. You have to avoid the nonsense of gestalt, which is uh, maybe no longer in the uh, lexicon of, of radiology teaching, but you absolutely have to avoid this concept that you can just stare at images and come up with the finding. So what our primary challenge then is to eliminate observational errors because the observations are the substrate for uh, reasoning. Let's look at another case. 30-year-old comes to the ER with acute onset of chills and throat pain. 
So this patient has obvious swelling of this tonsil, obvious edema back here in the retropharyngeal space, not, not abscess, but edema. And, uh, and uh, if you look at this, uh, you'll notice the jugular vein is patent here, and it is not patent here, and also there's a bunch of swelling out in the soft tissues of the neck here that's, uh, that's not on this side. So this is a very aggressive tonsillitis in an ostensibly immune-competent individual. You can even see even the sternocleidomastoid swollen over here. Down a little bit lower, the jugular is patent. So what is this? This is severe aggressive tonsillitis with internal jugular thrombosis, potentially Lemire syndrome, which is deadly. And so what happened in this case? Obvious findings, right? So there's the history I already gave you. Radiologist told EMS, severe pharyngitis without abscess. That was the interpretation. Well, that's sort of right. It was a spreading cellulitic kind of a, uh, aggressive pharyngitis. What the radiologist, inexperienced, non-expert radiologist missed was the occluded jugular vein. So, you know, the next thing to the patient is they have microabscesses in every important organ system, kidneys, liver, lungs, etc. cetera. Uh, so what the radiologist uh, didn't do? Well, didn't consider that if you diagnose severe pharyngitis, you better look for occlusion of the jugular vein. So the expert, fortunately, came in, reviewed, reviewing the case uh, promptly. This, there was no significant delay here. And, um, and that preliminary reading was changed to uh, acute uh, severe pharyngitis with potential Lemire syndrome. And so this root cause, again, is failure of contextual understanding. This in person who interpreted this study did not think that when they diagnosed by imaging a severe tonsillitis that they should look for jugular vein occlusion. Simple. It's that simple. So it's what I call situational awareness. Um, so, um, and uh, let's look at the data. 95% miss rate. So we've given a number of cases of of this uh, over our now eight-year simulation experience. Um, these are the average scores. So you can see in the simpler cases or more obvious cases, people do a little bit better. This is a perfectly acceptable uh, score. However, when they do poorly, you can see the studies are dominantly, uh, oh, sorry, the errors are dominantly on the observational parent, uh, category. You see how many residents we tested if you add all this up. It's a lot. And um, in, in the, uh, and again, this shows this, um, this issue of you can be educated about a topic, but if you're not fully educated, people will perform differently with different iterations of the problem. A very important emerging concept from our data. So what's an expert do, and how do we produce these? So our goals for our reporting and consulting are absolutely to avoid false negatives, okay, out of ignorance of either observation or interpretation or combination. We uh, need to uh, warn our clinicians that when we do confidently call a study negative, what it doesn't exclude. For instance, a negative head CT, even with contrast, doesn't exclude meningitis, right? So we have to be careful that that whoever we're advising as consultants doesn't get a false impression that our study does everything in that particular case, in that context. What we primarily have to do is eliminate this dominant rate of observational error, and that's what the second talk uh, deals with. It deals with a tool meant to do that. Uh, we then have to work on the interpretive error and focus our efforts on the errors that can cause high harm. One more case to sort of finish up because I really enjoy case-based learning. This is a bone marrow transplant unit patient, and they, were, uh, they came to us with the question of, uh, is, does this patient have invasive fungal sinus disease? The patient has uh, abnormal mucosal thickening in a posterior nasal cavity. It's invading the uh, pterygopalatine fossa by way of the sphenopalatine foramen. You can see the normal fat down here. The disease is all the way out to here. 
So clearly, this is a pattern of invasive fungal sinus disease. There's no question about that. So in that case that you just saw, uh, the initial interpretation by the non-expert was uh, no evidence of invasive fungal sinus disease. What did the MICU do, you know, the bone marrow transplant unit? They didn't call ENT to have a look. What did the expert do? Said, oh, that's an early case of invasive fungal sinus disease because of that invasion that I just described. Patient was, uh, disease was confirmed by otolaryngology, scoped the patient immediately, and patient was controlled with antifungal therapy. We've given this um, uh, a number of times. The root cause of the failure in this particular topic, which is important depending on, you know, the scope of your practice, uh, is um, it's all observation. This disease has a pattern that's almost unmistakable. There's about four or five or six different areas where the signs of early invasion can occur. You have to know those when you get these studies. If you don't know those in that context, then you will miss this. So again, we've given this concept four times, and I've already reviewed this data. And you can see the, um, the rate of uh, diagnosis, except for the case where there was a really obvious associated epidural abscess. The rate of failure, average score, are fails. And, uh, and, and that is not acceptable in this disease because, as, as, as you may know, this disease can lead to blindness, intracranial extension, and even potentially death because of intracranial extension and secondary bacterial abscess, as was in this case. And look at this. Some combined, a so few had no error, so a few residents did pretty good, but miserable pass rate here based on observational error. And again, I've given you the references for these papers and you can go look at them. So, let me make sure I didn't miss that. No, that's fine. So in summary, uh, what, what's the challenge? The challenge is that we have to do a better job at imparting basic knowledge. We have to treat anatomy, we have to treat what's normative and what isn't. We have to treat pathophysiology, and we have to put those in what we call co case concepts or clinical scenarios. And each of those are a unit of competency-based education. And that's the approach that needs to, we need to change. We need to have a competency-based curriculum. And uh, a, a, an evaluation rubric like the simulation that proves competency with authentic testing, not fake testing like multiple choice tests and a few images. Uh, authentic testing means you test what you actually do. And on a daily basis, we don't look at four pictures from a study and four multiple choice questions, right? We look at all the DICOM images and we render an opinion. We have to instill discipline that uh, there needs to be a, a, a a pattern of observation that's disciplined and complete and knowledgeable in clinical context and situational awareness. And that must be uh, one that has exclusionary rules so that you can call a study negative. And any report or consultation has to reflect this discipline process. And then we have to somehow transmit what I call medical wisdom which we can also do in our training uh, context. So um, that finishes uh, this part that outlines some causes and, and examples of the illustration of some of the persistent errors in uh, neuro and ENT imaging. Trust me, there are others. And I'll invite you again to the URL of my essays that set forth uh, the, the problem and suggestions for what we need to do about it. Our learning um, uh, platform can be found at, it's actually wittyonline.xray.ufl.edu. And I would, I would uh, invite you to uh, the uh, website uh, at the University of Florida where you can um, look at all this information, the essays, including access to our e-learning platform that is called Wisdom and Di U University of Florida, UFL, 
wisdom in diagnostic imaging, witty for short. Thank you.